Good evening, curious minds of the internet. I'm Alexa, the resident ooky spooky girly around here, and I'm so glad you've joined me this evening. Time travel is such a fun mystery for many, with many folks like myself positive that it does exist, but it's just been kept very, very secret. I've been pleading for someone to loan me, you know, a time travel machine for ages, just so I can go visit certain landmarks before they were destroyed by time. Imagine how many theme parks I could go see, and natural wonders. Oh gosh, I'll be dreaming about it all night. Before I get too distracted, here are the top five unexplained time travel stories that will leave you convinced. Kicking off today's list, in fifth place, we have a tale from a pilot. Now, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times, but I place a lot of belief and trust in experiences that come from pilots, since they are legitimately trained to recognize the unknown in the air and remember everything about what they see. My ADHD brain could never, ever, ever remember that much, unless it's like a hyperfixation, but even then, I wouldn't trust it to remember anything on command when I'm overwhelmed. So back in 1935, when he was, you know, a wing commander, Sir Victor Goddard was instructed to inspect an inactive airbase located in Drum, near Edinburgh in Scotland. While flying over it, Sir Goddard found the airbase to be in a poor state, with cattle grazing on the wild grass that had now forced its way through the tarmac. The entire place was completely in shambles. Later on that day, while flying his plane, he got into a bit of trouble thanks to the harsh weather conditions, and to avoid an accident, Sir Goddard decided to fly back to the abandoned airbase till the weather cleared out a bit. You know, just take your chances. As he approached the airbase, the torrential rain oddly and very abruptly gave way to bright sunshine when Sir Victor noticed that the airbase was not only in mint condition all of a sudden, but in use. He spotted mechanics wearing blue overalls working on the yellow planes parked on the runway, but was unable to recognize a single aircraft on the base. There was no way the place could have gone from decrepit to fully renovated and operational in like half an afternoon. And more importantly, these guys weren't wearing the khaki colored uniforms that were a norm back then. Also, the Air Force painted all their planes in silver, not yellow. Completely baffled by what the heck was going on, Sir Goddard got the shock of his life four years later. Europe was war-torn and he happened to visit Drum again, but this time he saw everything he saw four years back in 1935. So the same people in blue overalls servicing yellow planes, and he even found the plane he couldn't recognize before, now identifying it as a Miles Magister. I've had a glimpse into the future before myself, but never anything that detailed. I just predicted like one small event on the grand scheme of things. Thank goodness he didn't go mad from it, because I know I would've. In fourth place, we have the time-traveling hipster. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about the 11th Doctor. I'm more partial to the 9th, but I digress. In 2004, a black and white photo in the Their Past Lives Here exhibit at the Ray Lorne Pioneer Museum in British Columbia came to be and went largely unnoticed until the collection was digitized in 2010. The photo in question showed a crowd of spectators at an event, and on the back there was a note stating that it was taken in 1941 at the reopening of the South Fork Bridge in British Columbia. Nobody knows who took the photo, and the identity of anyone in the crowd is also completely unavailable. So when the collection made its way online, several internet users picked up on an oddity in the bridge photo. Popular websites got wind of the mystery and started republishing the photo in question. So you're probably asking by now, okay Alexa, you've said photo enough, what's so special about it? There's a single man in the crowd who looks completely out of place. Kind of like how I would look in a church right now, you know, dressed like this, or at my job where I wear a uniform. You know, the man's appearance is way too modern to fit with a 1947. He's wearing a modern t-shirt and modern sunglasses, and he's holding a camera that's way too small to have existed in 1941. Like, think those little digital cameras from the early 2000s. I used to have one. His appearance amongst men and women dressed much more formally, and in keeping with the era has led him to be dubbed the time-traveling hipster. Many folks, myself included, are pretty sure that the man was an imposter sent from the future to take photos of the South Fork Bridge for some unknown purpose. I know where y'all are going here with your brains, but Alexa, what if it was photoshopped for attention? Maybe the museum needed funding. As if I was gonna leave that stone unturned. The first piece of evidence to support its authenticity is actually from a second photo. It's a photo of the same event, but from a different angle, and was discovered shortly after the first one went viral. It is part of the John Wickskin collection, and is captioned, Opening of the New Bridge at South Fork. So this close-up shows the same modern-looking man from the original photo. Sure, it might be like a stretch, not completely impossible, to say that both photographs are fakes, given their different origins. Thankfully, we have more evidence of the original photograph's authenticity. In December of 2010, Evgeny Balamut and his colleague from Russian television channel NTV determined it was real and unedited with the help of a museum staffer. So my theory is that someone wanted to test out a time machine in a way that, you know, he could have visible proof of it working in the future, but without invading a massive event. Like, imagine if everyone with, you know, like a time machine went to the opening day of Disneyland. That would be pretty obvious. So they just pick something random and here we are. In third place, we have the Die Glock device. 
Since this device happens to be from World War II, I apologize in advance for how nonsensical I might sound, since the interweb world doesn't really like the name of the evil dictator at the time or his Yahtzee followers. In his 2001 book, The Hunt for Zero Point, author Nick Cook identified claims about Diaglock as having originated in the 2000 Polish book, The Truth About the Wonder Weapon, by Igor Witkowski. Nick describes Igor's claims of a device called the Bell, engineered by Yahtzee scientists, that was a glowing, rotating contraption rumored to have some kind of anti gravitational effect and be a time machine. I know I've already mentioned Doctor Who today, but what is right? It's right. According to Nick, Diaglock was a bell shaped about 12 feet high and 9 feet in diameter and incorporated two high speed counter rotating cylinders filled with a purplish liquid metallic looking substance that was supposed to be highly radioactive, with the code name Xerum 525. He recounts claims that scientists and technicians who worked on the bell and who did not, you know, die of its effects or disappear mysteriously were wiped out by the SS at the close of the war, and the device was moved to an unknown location. Nick proposed that SS officials Hans Kemmler later secretly traded this technology to the US military in exchange for his freedom. Historical theorists are pretty sure that a concrete ring called the Henge near the Wenceslaus mine that was built in 1943 and vaguely resembled Stonehenge was used as a launch pad for the Bell. Igor's book was translated to English in 2003 and he claimed to have discovered evidence of Diaglock in a review of World War II era documents that were declassified by the Polish government, which led him to additional research via the archives and interviews. The first document, allegedly supplied to Igor by an unnamed Polish government official, was an affidavit from the war crimes trial for General Jacob Sporenberg, who supposedly confessed to ordering the deaths of around 60 people who had knowledge of the secretive project. Kurt Debus, Werner von Braun, and Walter Gerlach were also allegedly implicated in the Die Glock research. Igor claims Die Glock was organized under a division of the Waffen SS and operated mainly at facilities in Lower Silesia. Die Glock was conceived in early 1942, and active experimentation began around mid 1944. Prisoners from the Gross Rosen concentration camp were exposed to radiation from Die Glock, resulting in many deaths and health problems. Survivors of the camp reported witnessing tests of the Die Glock, reporting a bright bluish light from the object. Igor believes. Xerum 525 was likely an irradiated form of mercury, used in the creation of a form of plasma that was intended as a weapon or propulsion system, and which would have been capable of distorting space and time. So what you're telling me is that there is indeed a time traveling device out there? I just need to find it? Game on. In second place, we have a very confused driver. Back in 1969, LC and his business associate, Bob, were driving along Highway 167 towards the oil center city of Lafayette after finishing lunch in the southwest Louisiana town of Abel, United States. It was the 20th of October and around 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon when they spotted an old turtleback car going really slow. They were, you know, intrigued by the vehicle because it wasn't something either of them had seen before. I had to look it up myself because I am honestly the most vehicle unaware person to exist. Honest to goodness, I exasperated the heck out of my dad growing up and to this day. He can go on and on and on about car makes, models, all the specifics, and I just sit there with no thoughts in my brain. For what it's worth, the vehicle in question would be very unique to the eye and definitely an antique. But here's the thing, even though the vehicle looked like a blast from the past, it was in mint condition. The duo overtook the vehicle, but not before slowing down right next to it to check it out, you know, in detail, just for curiosity's sake. Clearly printed on it, which was quite odd because antique cars weren't allowed to be driven on the road at that that time unless they were being used for a ceremonial parade. Things just got weirder from there. The person driving the car was a young woman dressed in a 1940s dress, complete with a hat and fur coat, and she was accompanied by a small boy who also was dressed in a heavy coat and a cap. As the men pulled up next to the car, the lady started panicking, frantically looking back and forth as if she was in the middle of somewhere completely unknown. So Elsie asked her if she needed any help, to which she, you know, she responded yes, but at no point did she roll down the window or even look him in the eye. After asking her several times to halt the vehicle so they could help, the guys finally saw her pull over on the side of the road. Elsie and Bob passed her and pulled over in front of her, but as soon as they looked behind them, the woman's vehicle was gone, as if it had completely vanished into thin air. So this was a highway without any traffic, so no disappearing of this could be possible in any way. Completely shocked and not knowing how to describe what had just happened, Elsie and Bob decided to keep on driving on. A little while later, while they were still on Highway 167, they saw another new car pass a very old car at a really slow speed. It was apparently so slow that it looked like the cars had come to a halt. And as soon as the new car pulled over in front of the old car, the same thing happened. It stopped and then completely disappeared. They couldn't believe their eyes. 
and neither would I. Even the guy in the other car was completely shocked. The three started describing what each had seen while walking around the area in hopes of finding some sort of evidence. The third guy insisted they should be reporting this to the police, as this, according to him, was a missing person case. Elsie and Bob refused, more so because they had no idea where the woman and the boy, along with the car, had vanished. They never saw the vehicle again, so I hope that lady and her ward found their way home. In first place, we have the Wall Street Time Traveler. On the 28th of January in 2003, a 44-year-old man named Andrew Carlson was arrested and detained by the police for insider trading on Wall Street. Over a two-week period in the stock market, Andrew went from having $800 to making, okay, guess, go on, $350 million. Whatever he invested turned into gold. So I asked my dad about his odds, and he confirmed that it's nearly impossible to make the kind of profits he did without, you know, insider knowledge. He was arrested by the cops on the allegation that he must have had, yep, illegal insider information. But when asked why and how he did this during a four hour long confession, Andrew claimed to be a man from the year 2256. Since he was from the future, he claimed he knew exactly how the 126 stocks he invested in were gonna perform. Now, Obviously, the cops thought this guy was chatting just rubbish. But soon after he was released on bail, the man disappeared from the face of Earth, and even after repeated attempts, he was not found. Was he telling the truth? Who knows, but wait for it. I'm gonna blow your mind. Andrew predicted the exact date of the US invasion of Iraq. I know, I don't know. I do not know. And now that I'm once again pleading for someone to please, please, please share their time traveling secrets with me, we've sadly reached the end of our time for today. Pretty, 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 please. I promise I won't tell, but if someone watching could share a device with me, I would be forever grateful. While I wait around in the present, be sure to let me know in the comments if you at home have ever experienced a time glitch of any sort. And as always, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos.